Hello and welcome to this very special interview. Joining me today is Dr. Bimal Jalan, who's the former RBI governor, a former member of parliament, and one of India's most leading voices when it comes to the economy. Thank you very much, Dr. Jalan. It's very kind of you to say so much. <laughs> I genuinely believe that. No, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Dr. Jalan, we are in the phase where, as you mentioned in the last interview that I did with you, that sooner than later we'll be in the middle of elections and everyone, investors across markets, are going to be more concerned about the outcome. We are in that crossroad right now. We've heard a lot from several political leaders in terms of what their agendas would be, but I want to devote a large part of this interview to understand from you what, according to you, should be the agenda to, first, let's talk about the economy, to bring it back. There almost seems to be this feeling that someone is going to come there with a magic wand and we'll be back to 7 and 8 percent. But what, according to you, are the two or three things that the government, whichever comes, should focus on to bring things no, back? The first point I would like to highlight, you know, with your permission, is that politics really trumps economics. You know, ultimately, Policy making is the function of the political setup. I mean, they may get economic advice and so on and so forth, but ultimately it's the political shape. And uh, so it will very much depend, I mean, the agenda. Agenda, I mean, I don't want to talk sort of theoretical agenda. I want to talk practically. So the first uh, m major issue is going to be that what kind, uh, if, as we foresee, as we look forward to, what kind of uh, a coalition, coalition it is going to be. But one, what kind of a coalition are we going to have? If you have a fractious political system, then the best agenda is to somehow manage. Manage the system, manage the system. Because what you mentioned about investors and everything else and growth, etc., is all a function of uncertainty. And it's not policy paralysis per se. I mean, you know, there is a lot in the media, there has been a lot of talk about policy paralysis. You use the word stasis once. Yeah, uh, stasis. Yes, I mean, I think it is that people don't know, you know, A, what would be the shape of the government because of the fractious nature, multiple party, and this is a very important political issue that we have to grapple with. I don't think we will, but I, I must tell you that uh, there is a short-term expectation of the life of government. And if the life of government, I mean, I tell you, from 1989, we've had nine governments. Was that the constitutional design? You know, I mean, the whole idea, and four of them full term, but five of them less than one year. Now, if you have governments of that type, then the political agenda, the best political agenda is don't create uncertainty. Sorry to be so long. And, uh, but let us hope that we have a functional government. I don't know whether we will, but we have a functional government. We have a government which enjoys a reasonable number of seats in a parliament of five, five, in a, in a Lok Sabha of 543 members, and not a government which is a coalition of, uh, say, 20 members each of different parties. Because there is no shared ideology in our system, as you can see. So when you talk about an agenda, it has to be a shared agenda. We can't have multiple voices. We must have collective responsibility of cabinet. And uh, if you combine fractiousness of politics with short-term life expectancy of government, then the best agenda is to make sure that we don't get into a law and order problem, to make sure that people who invest are not, uh, uh, not subject to you know, changing policies, reverse policies, then we'll be in trouble. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to take on a bit on that uh, definition of yours. When you differentiate between policy paralysis and policy stasis, are you saying that the biggest issue which industry and investors have faced is that there was no decisiveness. Take a decision. Was that the problem? That yeah, you don't you take know, a decision? No, you know, the, there are two, two separate uh, sides to it. One is reversal of policy. You know, as we saw in the entire retrospective. Yeah, 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 yeah. Retrospective, then retail trade, then one, uh, one uh, retailer, two retailer, three. I'm not saying which is meritorious, which is sure, good, but, which but is bad. be consistent. But if you are government, and you announce a policy and you reverse it. Because say if the media is against it or somebody is against it or something is against it, if you're doing something wrong, then you should say I have done something wrong. But uh, you know, switching policies, so doing something, and without uh, saying you know, retrospective taxation or 
double taxation or something else. So it creates a lot of uncertainty. And uh, it, to my mind, when I make a difference between policy paralysis and policy stasis, you know, which is that policy doesn't move in our system just now, or you know, I mean, uh, over a period of time. But policy uh, paralysis would be that you need policy reforms, for example, and don't get it. As far as I am concerned, I believe that India's fundamentals are stronger than ever before. Fundamentals. If you look at skills, if you look at our media, you, if you look at our technology, I mean, the world over, Indians are heading technological companies, you know, all kinds of IT firms and so on. It's not only the back room. It's not only the call center. So if you look, look at technology, engineering expertise, if you look at all our, uh, you know, these skills, then you look at our savings rate. Savings rate is one of the highest in the world. It has declined in the last two years, yes. But it's still high. It's still high, high enough. You know, then, uh, and at the moment, fortunately for us, the current account deficit has come down. And uh, we are in a reasonable shape, and I must, uh, congratulate or I must express my own sense of satisfaction as a citizen that on both fiscal deficit and current account deficit, we are doing much better than what you would have forecast here six months ago. But what I'm trying to get to is that if we can do what we say we will do, for example, if you say that I want infrastructure investment, we have an investment committee, for example, at the level of the prime minister's committee. If we announce plans that we are going to invest X thousand crores. And if you can see on the ground that this is actually happening, then I believe that there is nothing which can stop India. And that, you believe, happened a little too late in the day. It started happening in the last few months, but perhaps too little. No, no, but it's not it's still, you know, I mean, it's still one is not sure. It's only announcements yet. The money hasn't happened. Yeah, you don't know. I want to talk to you, sir, about yeah. uh, inflation, because that's been one of the big problems. Yes. And of course, we've seen, and we've talked about this in our previous interviews, we've seen this whole raging debate between RBI's approach to it and the government's approach to it, et cetera, et cetera. But again, I want to ask you in a more progressive way. What, according to you, can be done or should be done by the next government to actually bring inflation down? You know, there are two parts of it. One is we must take into account that in inflation, the what you say, food prices, are a very major part of our CPI index as well as our WPI, the food. Now, if you have a drought, then prices of food will go up, your average rate of inflation will go up also, and there is not very much that you can do. And if you squeeze credit, or if you squeeze investment, or if you raise interest rates to fight that kind of inflation, then there's a problem. The point I'm making is let's go to the source of inflation. Is it excess demand? Is it excess money supply? Is it excess credit? Is it, or is it something else? Now, in our system, inflation, for example, if you look at it six months ago, nobody could say that you would actually improve it. So I, I feel that uh, if, the, if you don't have a drought problem, if you don't have, then we have administered prices. And if you are a bit conservative on administered prices, and the, if particularly if the monsoon is good, then inflation can be controlled. And of course, the, you know, your money supply and et cetera, et cetera, have to be watched to make sure that there is no excess hoarding, either of food or other things. So the point I'm trying to make is, so far as inflation in India is concerned, the long-term prospects are not adverse. And they are in, in uh, but I don't believe in inflation targeting. You me. don't believe? No. That. I don't believe that we should target an inflation over a medium term. You can target an inflation for the current year. If you have a drought today, thankfully we don't, then you can, you can say that today, depending on our monsoon condition, and as you can see, the monsoon forecast is good. I mean, everything is good, you know, just now, as of now that uh, we expect inflation to be X percent, 4 percent, 5 percent, that you can see. But I don't believe in medium-term inflation targeting. And where do you stand, sir, in this entire debate about what is RBI's mandate? This is oh. a global debate now. Is, is it price stability alone? Is it attacking inflation alone? Or as the government would want it to be, that it should also be balancing out growth? Where, where, what is your view in this entire? Oh, no, my, my, my view is very straightforward. You look around the world. 
you know, I mean, in the sense that uh, earlier the orthodoxy was that uh, monetary policy and inflation is are with the central bank's role and uh, the economic growth, etc., is non-central bank. I mean, it's the government's role or whatever, you know, investor. But you look at what the U.S. is doing. You know, if you look at what U.S. is doing, if you look at what's happening in Europe, if you look at what's happening in Japan, the three largest industrial combines, you know, you find that it's the responsibility of the government, it's the responsibility of the system, it's the responsibility of our political system to generate growth, employment also. And RBI has to be a part of that struggle. Now, if things are stable, if, for example, if, say, the rate of growth is 8%, 7% that we want to have, if the employment growth is reasonable, if enough job opportunities are available, and then you can say that RBI should look after monetary policy, and that's it, you see? I mean, but my main um, sort of point that I'm making, that it's a joint responsibility. RBI is a part of a larger system of governance, and we should regard it as part of that system. And everything that RBI does, to my mind, must be in consultation, must be in coordination, and must be in consonance with the policy which is decided by the government as the political authority. Because I go back to the earlier issue, that you can't run economics without politics. You've been the longest serving governor, and the current governor is only six months into his job. Do you believe that, so far, RBI's actions in the last six months have been in line with the way you would expect it to be? I think they've been very good. I'm not paying just a compliment to, um, to Raghuram Rajan, who also happens to be a friend of mine, but the way they have handled everything. I mean, if you look at the go back, you know, six months, and you will find at that time there was a lot of uncertainty about exchange rate. Today there is stability. You will go back and you, there was capital, uh, in, uh, capital outflows, you know, because of tapering. Now, U.S. has done further ta tapering, but we are not seeing that kind of a shake-up in our external sector. When you look at fiscal deficit, trade, uh, fiscal deficit, current account deficit, in combination with the government, things are in good shape. So I would say that, yes, the, I mean, it's never an easy job, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm glad as a citizen. <laughs>
and just uh, instead of saying that so much allocation here, so much allocation there, that you then reimburse whatever they've been able to accomplish. You can send a team to investigate that everything has been done. And if they are doing well, you know, you reimburse them. So I'm, you know, I mean, they're raising a very fundamental point, which is again this whole uh, old ethos that all resources belong, public resources belong to the center. And the center allocates. Why? And you believe which is, whichever is the government which comes to power should look at these issues? No, no, yes, of course. I mean, for example, you take the building of roads. You take the states or bridges. I mean, I remember it because I was also in the planning commission for some time. Yes, which is why I asked you. Uh, no, 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 but the planning commission for some time. And we started, you see, the whole debate is always with the states. Uh, how much will the roads in the Northeast cost? 30,000 crores, 40,000. No, no, we can't do 30,000. We will do 20,000. Now, supposing, and we did it at that particular point of time. We said that you build roads. And here is 100 crores of advance. And when you spent 80 crores, then we will give you another 100 crores of advance to different states. You know, and uh, once you and then a, a, a delegation would go after some time to see that the roads are actually built and all that sort of thing. So you'd make an appraisal system. And you found that you couldn't spend. There was no shortage of money. There was shortage of implementation in our country. Now then you can say that, you know, but what happens, you know, poor states won't get as much money and the large states will get more money. But everybody wants roads. You know, in JNK at that time, militancy had stopped, but all the bridges were down. But we've got to try to allocate amount of money, X amount of money, B amount of money, you know, something, something. Instead of that, we said we build bridges. Everybody wants that. I want to ask you a question as a citizen of this country. You've seen India closely in various capacities for many, many years. Do you believe that perhaps for the first time, and it's a reflection of the change in society, that these elections, we are hearing far more about economic issues coming to the fore. Is this a new India, so to speak, which talks about well-being, which talks about a better life across the board. It's not just an urban phenomenon. Are you seeing that change in India? Again, you've asked a very important question, and I <laughs> can go on talking about it. But you see, the, after independence, and I'm giving you a perspective, a historical perspective, after, say, 56, until about, say, 91, long, long, long period, you know, nearly four decades, we were bound up in balance of payments crisis, how to pay for oil, how to pay for food, how to pay, you remember, 60s, 70s, if you, you know, 80s. I mean, you know, the whole time it was balance of payments, balance of payments problem, how to pay for this, how to pay for this, get an IMF loan, conditionality, not conditionality, World Bank assistance. Look at us today. You know, we have never had the kind of economic strength that we have today. We never had the kind of, uh, what you might say, the autonomy in policy making that we have today. You know, we are not going around asking for food. We can import food. We can pay for it if there is a drought. If there is any other problem, we can handle it. We have reasonable reserves. If we want to ma manage our uh, you know, external sector, we can do it. If the, when the current account deficit was high, it was a policy uncertainty which was leading to all the uh, problems, but today we have been able to manage all this. Now, what I'm trying to get at is that all the that India today is in a much stronger position, much better position to deliver what we want to deliver in terms of benefits to the poor, in terms of poverty alleviation, in terms of investments, and making India the real emerging power. But what it needs is a decisive leadership. No, no it needs two things. One is some some part of what I have talked about is power, is that power centralization, the governmental powers to allocate resources, ministerial powers rather. What I'm saying is that I'm not the government, parliament, they, should, they are supreme, they can decide policy. But once you've decided policy, let some independent, some autonomous agency decide the delivery. And what's the, I mean, what's the problem if you can have election commission, CVC, CAG, give the best, uh, you know, uh, kind of framework of uh, maintenance of democratic spirits and accountability. And, and yet you have the largest corruption in the world. Why? 
What is, what is corruption about? That if you want to get any permission, you have to go to six ministries, seven ministries. The largest number of ministries in the world are probably in India. The largest number of ministers we probably have here. So every decision making involves six, seven ministries. My favorite example is about, uh, you know, that if you wanted to set up a sports facility for rural student girls, how many ministries would be involved? Sports, rural development, then women and welfare, then education, because girls, students. You know, so this is why. Think about it. So we need, you know, we need political reform of a type which can give us a stable government, which can make sure that if you're enjoying the power, you're actually delivering. And so those are very long-term issues, and I can go on talking and talking, but they are very important issues. And I hope the, what you are seeing today, public consciousness, you mentioned that there is much greater today emphasis on delivery, emphasis on trying to reach the poor, poverty alleviation, emphasis on providing basic facilities, and emphasis on ensuring that institutions work, which is, which is a great benefit, and over time, I hope, it will actually happen. Just to close this interview, I can't but help not talk about the very important piece of reform that you've just submitted the other day to the RBI. I know you've said that you're not going <laughs> yeah, to yeah, talk I about any specifics, uh -huh. but uh, when we last spoke, you gave a timeline and you've stuck to that. Are you hopeful that sooner than later we will have new banks in this country? No, I can't comment on that part. But there is, a, you know, I mean that uh, the, the system is there. The RBI is there. This is the responsibility of the RBI to take a decision. Now, of course, there is electoral cycle and all these other, um, you know, related developments which may uh, affect decision-making process to a certain extent. But, you know, I mean, we can do what we want to do, subject, of course, to what you can say is the political propriety. And on that, I can't comment. Sure. But I, without going into at all, uh, Dr. Jalan, into the contents of your report, but is there a, at least a certain set? You scrutinized a large number of uh, entities. But is there a certain set which you believe or you've recommended can get the license very quickly? No. Let me put it this way. That the entire scrutiny process was very elaborate and was done by the RBI. Right. Uh, this was an advisory committee which looked at the amount of work that was done. And we had five meetings, I think. And uh, then some further information, if it was required, it was asked for. And it was, you know, you got that information thanks to the RBI's extremely hard work, I mean, I must uh, tell you. And, but all the scrutiny was done by them. They were a part of the process. And uh, then some recommendations have been made. I can't go into any sure. detail. But uh, the, the main thing that I want to say that this is a continuing process, hopefully. It's not, uh, you know, once and for all, but it's a continuing process. And we will see how it goes. It's I'm trying to be evasive. <laughs> I know that, and I won't push you. But thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you.